Manny Man Does History. Since winning their independence and ratifying their constitution in 1789, the United States of America began expanding across North America through purchase, conquest, forced migration and genocide, bringing in new territories to the Union. Since its colonial times, America saw a huge trade in enslaved people from Africa as these people were brought and sold as property. After independence, the states in the North looked against slavery, many believing it to be contradictory to the ideals of a republic. The importing of enslaved people to the United States was prohibited in 1808, but the internal slave trade in the southern states continued strongly. With the invention of the cotton gin used for quickly and easily processing cotton, the cotton industry took off in the South, fueled by slave labour. The northern states had become more industrialised and people worked on a basis of free labour, being paid to work by an employer. The southern states hadn't industrialised, relying on agriculture, the slave trade and the cotton industry for the economy. The presidential election of 1860 saw the rise of Republican Party candidate Abraham Lincoln, who proposed banning slavery in all the American territories to stop it spreading. People in the South saw this as a move towards the eventual abolition of slavery in all the states. They thought this was against their constitutional rights and increasingly didn't like the northern states making decisions that would affect the very different South. After Lincoln's election, the southern states were ready to leave. There were attempts to compromise on slavery, but they were rejected, and thus seven of the southern states declared their secession from the United States and became the Confederate States of America, with its capital in Montgomery, Alabama. The North, and indeed Unionists in the South, saw this as illegal, believing the Founding Fathers established a perpetual union. Along with a conflict in ideology towards slavery, there was also strong nationalism between the northern and southern states, the south worrying they could become proverbial slaves to the industrial north. James Buchanan, who was still president at this point, didn't want to aggravate the south and start a war, but confederacy forces began to capture federal forts in their territories. Lincoln was sworn in as president March 4, 1861, and he insisted on the perpetual union and any secession was legally void. He wasn't going to enforce federal law where it wasn't wanted, but he would use force to maintain federal property. The Confederacy offered to pay for the property, but Lincoln wouldn't treat with them as it would give some recognition to the Confederate government. Lincoln insisted U.S. forces hold on to any forts they still had within the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States of America, ordered the surrender of Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, but negotiations didn't work. Confederate forces bombarded Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861, which sparked the beginning of the American Civil War. This attack rang across the northern states, rallying them together against the Confederacy, believing it to be a minority of secessionists in the South, though that was not the case. Lincoln called for 75,000 troops to fight. He began ordering more and more troops south to recapture the federal buildings which were falling to the Confederacy. U.S. war veteran and military leader Robert E. Lee was offered command of the Union Army, but he declined, refusing to fight against his native state of Virginia as its sympathies lay with the Confederacy. Refusing to send troops against their neighbours, slave states Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee and Arkansas actually joined the Confederacy, with the capital getting moved to Richmond, Virginia. Some Native American tribes in the Indian territories sided with the Confederacy, becoming their allies, hoping for support from the Confederacy. And that paid off. Other border states, Maryland, Kentucky, Delaware and Missouri, were slave states but were against both the South secession and fighting against the South. As Union soldiers from the North moved towards Maryland, anti-Lincoln protesters rioted, 
Lincoln declared martial law in Maryland and Union naysayers were imprisoned, otherwise Washington DC could be surrounded by Confederate states. Feeling forgotten by the Union, the Arizona territories seceded and later joined the Confederacy. As more states left the Union, US Congress stated that the war was to preserve the Union, not to end slavery. Some slaves began fleeing their owners to reach the northern states, but were held as wartime contraband and put to work for the Union. General Winfield Scott came up with the Anaconda Plan to blockade the South and weaken the Confederacy without bloodshed, but people demanded Richmond be taken back. The odds were very much on the Union's side, as it had the greater population. Just under half of the Confederacy's population were enslaved people, and the slave owners weren't going to arm them any time soon. In July 1861, the Union Army began to advance into Virginia, but met Confederacy forces at Bull Run near Manassas in the first major battle of the war. Although initially successful, the Union forces were stopped by General Thomas Jackson, who gained the nickname Stonewall Jackson because of his stern defence. The famous rebel yell of the Confederate Army drove the Union back to Washington. George McClelland would become General-in-Chief to whip the Union Army into shape. This war was not going to be as short as expected. This war was the first industrial war where railways, telegrams, armoured ships and improved weapons came into play. The cotton industry in the South was being crippled by the Union's blockade. The Confederacy hoped that the countries of Europe would step in, supporting the South, being avid customers of the slave-made cotton. But Europe found its cotton elsewhere and let the Americans sort out their differences. The British developed small blockade runners to continue trading for cheap cotton from the South, which just about kept the South's economy going, for a while at least. With the absence of the Southerners from the US Senate, the House Republicans were able to bring in many bills previously blocked by Southerners, including income tax, which would help fund the war. Kentucky ended its neutrality in favour of the Union when it was invaded by Leonidas Park's Confederacy forces. At the end of 1861, splinter governments of Missouri and Kentucky joined the Confederacy, but held little sway in those states. In 1862, the Union chose to move in on multiple fronts through Virginia, Kentucky and up the Mississippi River. In Missouri, Confederacy forces were driven out early. Ulysses S. Grant pushed through Kentucky, capturing Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, opening up the Tennessee River. Accepting only unconditional surrender from the Confederates, he became known as Unconditional Surrender Grant and was a hero to the Union. The blockaded Confederacy knew they couldn't match the Union's fleet, so they developed ships with iron hulls and began converting their smaller fleet into ironclads. When the CSS Virginia went up against the wooden Union fleet, it decimated them. But the following day, the Union's first ironclad, the USS Monitor, arrived and the Battle of the Ironclads was fought to a draw. But it revolutionised naval warfare forever. Wooden warships were now obsolete. In April, as the Union moved further into Tennessee, the Confederacy led a surprise attack in Shiloh, pushing Union forces to the river. But as the Union Navy arrived, Grant's forces mounted a counterattack and won a bloody battle and decisive victory against the Confederacy. Meanwhile, in Northern Virginia, Union forces under George McClelland had been moving very slowly towards Richmond. They were ultimately forced to retreat at the Seven Days Battle by General Robert E. Lee's superiorly numbered forces. Union forces under John Pope tried to push south again and failed again. Confident after their victories, Confederacy forces invaded the north, General Lee pushing into Maryland on September 5th. Two weeks later, Lee's forces met McClellan's at the Battle of Antietam the bloodiest single day in United States history, ending in Confederacy retreat. In December, new Major General Ambrose Burnside once again pushed for Richmond, but was heavily defeated by Lee at Fredericksburg. 
Frederick Douglass, a former enslaved person and well-travelled social reformer, had been campaigning for the abolition of slavery. That that's what this war was truly about. In January 1863, Lincoln brought about the Emancipation Proclamation, an executive order that led to the freeing of three million slaves in the Confederate States. Many African Americans joined the Union Army to fight against slavery. The Union went through a few different generals in the East, unable to defeat General Lee's forces. Despite being outnumbered two to one, Lee was victorious at Chancellorsville, although he did lose Stonewall Jackson to friendly fire. West Virginia separated from Virginia and became neutral. As General Lee made another push into the North, Major General George Meade took charge of the Union forces and they fought for three days in July at the Battle of Gettysburg, the bloodiest battle of the war, with huge losses on both sides. Lee retreated, but Meade was not able to capture their forces. This battle was the turning point of the war, as the Confederacy threat was never as great. The draft laws in the North, bringing new people into the army, weren't popular, and riots broke out in New York. Many soldiers deserted too. Many got into the war for ideological reasons, for adventure, or simply to defend their home. But the horrors of war changed many of their minds. In the West, Grant captured Vicksburg, the last Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi. The Union now had complete control over the Great River and effectively split Confederacy forces in two. Texas was cut off from the Confederacy, but under General Kirby Smith, they managed to hold up strong defences and a self-sufficient economy. In November, Lincoln spoke at Gettysburg and recalled back to the foundation of the United States. Four score and seven years ago... Our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, and how this nation shall have a new birth of freedom. Grant relieved besieged Union forces at Chattanooga, pushing Confederacy forces out of Tennessee, leaving Union forces looking at the heartland of Confederacy. With the start of 1864, Grant was made commander of all Union armies by Lincoln. He decided on a huge coordinated campaign, pushing into the Confederacy from all directions. Grant pushed his forces down through Virginia towards the Confederacy capital, Richmond, fighting Lee's army along the way, both sides suffering heavily. It was a war of attrition. Despite setbacks for the Union, Grant pushed on, driving Lee to Richmond and the close-by Petersburg. Lee moved to defend Petersburg as it was the railway supply line for the capital. Grant's forces dug trenches and a ten-month siege ensued. Meanwhile, Union forces under William Tecumseh Sherman moved from Chattanooga and captured Atlanta, Georgia in September 1864. Other Union forces swept along the Shenandoah Valley, fighting the only remaining Confederate army, ultimately defeating them. That November, Abraham Lincoln was re-elected president, defeating Democrat candidate George McClelland. Sherman marched his army through Georgia towards Savannah, destroying industry, infrastructure and civilian property along the way, known as the March to the Sea. Sherman captured Savannah on December 21st and offered it as a Christmas present to President Lincoln. The Confederate Army of Tennessee was also defeated in Nashville. Only the army in North Carolina and Lee's besieged army in Petersburg were all that remained to fight for the Confederacy. At the start of 1865, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to abolish slavery, except as a form of punishment, was approved by the U.S. Congress. Change was happening. With advancing Union reinforcements, Lee ultimately evacuated Petersburg and Richmond. Union forces secured the city. Outnumbered and outgunned, General Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th. 1865. Grant would not arrest the Confederate army and they could keep their sidearms and horses. News of the surrender spread and celebrations erupted in Washington. On April 14th, days later, 
The Stars and Stripes was raised over Fort Sumter, where it all began. That evening, Abraham Lincoln went to a play with his wife in Ford's Theatre. There, he was shot by John Wilkes Booth and later died. Vice President Andrew Johnson became president. Throughout May, the remainder of the Confederacy forces surrendered and the Civil War ended. The States of America were united once more. After the war, there was a stronger sense of unity across the nation, the union that so many people had died to preserve. Over 700,000 people died in this war, the deadliest war in American history. In December 1865, The 13th Amendment was ratified and slavery was abolished. Grant would become president in 1869. Life would go on. The United States endured, although divisions remained in the minds of many. Racism didn't end with slavery. Grant attempted to guarantee the rights of African Americans in the South by stationing the army in the South as part of Reconstruction. But after a dubious presidential election, the army was withdrawn and Reconstruction ended before it was finished. As time went on, the Republican Party became less interested in civil rights for African Americans in favour of big business. The 20th century saw black communities segregated from white communities, especially in the Deep South. It wouldn't be for the 1950s and 60s that many people stood together to demand equal rights for people of colour. Today, racism is still an element in life, sometimes bubbling below the surface, sometimes not so much. The Civil War still lingers in the mind of many Americans and acts as a reminder of how far people can go when faced with giving up what they see as their God-given right, even when it is to the detriment of the lives of others. Ba-bum!